you know, it changes the dynamic. It changes how you feel as a child of God when you can get past your own personal confines and see that God is doing something in all the pastors and all the churches and all the Christians that God is working out his plan for our lives. And I thank and praise God for having a seat in his kingdom and a portion on his program. I've got a long ways to go tonight, so if you have your scriptures with you, I want to invite your attention to the book of Job. Job chapter 1, I'd like to read in your hearing, although that entire first chapter is our context. In the interest of time, I just want to read verses 13 through 15 out of the New King James Version of the Bible. And this is the word of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters, meaning Job, were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabians raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I am the designated survivor. Amen. You may be seated. Many of you know that Designated Survivor is a political drama television series created by David Guggerheim that starred Keith Sutherland and showed on ABC. As the plot unravels, for those of you who are uninformed, right at the beginning of the show, an explosion claims the lives of the president and all the members of the cabinet, including the vice president, on the night of the State of the Union address. Keith R. Sutherland in the drama, who plays Tom Kirkman as the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, is suddenly thrust into the position of Commander in Chief because according to White House protocol, he is the designated survivor. And perhaps somebody on your pew tonight has similarly lived a life that has been riveted by trial and pierced by pain and shaken by trouble because I've discovered that trial, trouble, and tragedy are equal opportunity afflictions that practice no discrimination. We do not have to seek them, and yet we cannot avoid them because trial, trouble, and tragedy will find you. Is there a witness here tonight? You cannot build a wall, President Trump, to keep them out because trial, trouble, and tragedy are ubiquitous in nature. They will not be subjected, Michael Bloomberg, to anybody's stop and frisk policy, but they will show up anytime, anywhere, with anybody. No one, regardless of faith, family, fitness, or finance, has a future devoid of trouble and tragedy. In the each life, some rain will fall. It rains on the just as well as the unjust. Even though you love God, even though you come to revival, even though you're working to keep your life spiritually on track, trial, trouble, and tragedy are somewhere, my friend, on your agenda. Smile at your neighbor and say, I know that's right. Eh? And if you have never boxed with trouble, if you have never wrestled trial, if you have never had a run-in with tragedy, as my Mississippi grandmother was fond of saying, keep on living. And don't worry, if it doesn't show up tonight, it'll be there the first thing in the morning. That's why our ancestors used to sing songs like Trouble in My Way. I have to cry sometimes. I lay awake at night, but that's all right, because I know Jesus will fix it after a while. They understood that trial and trouble and tragedy visit every life. And nowhere, my friends, is this reality better illustrated than in the scriptural story of a man named Job. 
according to the testimony of the text. Job lived somewhere east of Palestine on a fertile plain surrounded by arid desert conditions. He had carved out for himself and for his family a little oasis in the midst of deadly desert denial. The first entry on his resume, what we are told about him is that he was a man of moral authenticity, ethical character, and religious devotion. More specifically, the text says he was blameless or perfect. But in the Hebrew text, the ancient Masoretic Hebrew text of the original, that is actually a bad translation because a better translation would be able to say that Job was balanced. Let the whole church say balanced. He had balance in his life. He feared God, not in the sense of being intimidated or terrified by God, but in the sense of giving due regard to God and holding himself humbly accountable and rightly related to Almighty God. Job had a faith that began with his acknowledgement of the being, the power, and the love of God. Can I talk to you for a moment on the downside? Because the truth is, far too many people that you know and I know have little daily regard for God. Most people think of God in, in terms of crisis or convenience, but lack consciousness of God on a day-to-day, step-by-step, decision-by-decision basis. Most people do not reverence God in their budgets, their bills, their calendars and nor in the way they speak to treat and regard other people but not so with Job. Job was balanced, blameless and upright. He highly regarded God and faithfully turned away from evil. He did not flirt with sin nor dance with dysfunction. Job was married and the father of seven tall handsome sons and three gorgeous vivacious daughters. Job Job had the wherewithal and the wealth to take care of them, rear them, educate them, and provide the best for them. Job was a very rich and proud Syrian sheik. There was oil underneath his land and diamonds in his foothills. Job had not just income, but if you read it, he had wealth. 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys, and countless servants. And I want you to know that Job is one of my scriptural heroes because even though he occupied a powerful and privileged place in human society, he still had decency enough to recognize the humanity, respect the dignity, affirm the equality, resolve the complaints, and extend sensitivity to the weakest and poorest persons in his sphere of influence. Job sacrificed his riches, sanctified his children, prayed for the world in a daily routine of piety, fortified faith, and demonstrated devotion. And therefore, it should not surprise any of us that his name came up in heaven. Can I talk to you for a moment? Because the narrative of the text reports that one day in the tribunal of eternity, when the solemn assembly of the Supreme Court of everlasting justice had been convened, the Bible says Satan showed up. That cynical, negative, pessimistic, prosecuting attorney stepped into the sacred precincts of omnipotent presence. There was no hallelujah in his mouth, no joy joy in his soul, no smile on his face, no tithe in his hand, no prayer in his spirit, and no thanksgiving on his mind. He had a cynical snare on his face, a negative, critical, narrow way of looking at life. And according to his point of view, there was nothing true, honorable, pure, or commendable anywhere. There was nobody that deserved an accolade or a compliment, nothing to be affirmed, lauded, or applauded, nothing to rejoice over, thank God for, or be happy about. And can I tell you, that's the same hellish temptation 
temptation that the devil brings to each one of us. The devil wants to get in your mind and make you completely unaware of the blessings you already have and insensitive to the grace that you've already been given. The adversary wants you to focus only on what you don't have, what you can't do, who's against you, how many problems you have, and how many things have gone wrong in your life. And yet here is God blessing us every day, waking us up every morning, filling our lives with security, possibility, and opportunity. But the enemy wants us only to see the negative things, the petty people, the uncooperative circumstances, the unfavorable conditions, and the hurtful scenarios. Because the goal of the devil, as I tried to tell you last night, is to make us all critical and negative and nasty in the hope that we will give up our dreams and forsake our God-given destiny. The enemy will even come to church with you, sit down next to you, and whisper in your ear. Tell your neighbor, say, stay out of my ear. Amen. The devil, the devil will work on you in church and cause you to listen for all the flaws and mistakes, for all the times when the soloist may have missed the note or the choir may have missed the melody. It'll make you look critically at the ushers, make you frown at the visitors, get you so focused on what somebody has on their head rather than what somebody has in their heart. And then, having gotten you at church, the enemy will follow you home. You do know that some folk go home and don't do anything but fuss and fume, gripe and grumble, cuss and complain. They sit quiet in church and then raise hell at home. The devil showed up among divinity. He was definitely out of place. He did not deserve to be up in heaven where he was. But the truth is, none of us really deserve deserve to be in the presence of God and yet out of his opulent mercy and amazing grace God permitted the devil to walk wistfully among the stars and keep company with the holy angels I gotta stick a pen right there because people ask me all the time why I allow certain kinds of people to be in the church or serve in the ministry or work in the ministry or sing in the choir or be a part of the diaconate or serve on the pulpit, it's because I fundamentally understand at the core of my being that none of us deserve to be here, that we are all where we are, what we are, who we are, by the grace of Almighty God. See, often, my friends, we want a purity, a sanctity, and an exclusivity in the church that does not even exist in heaven. For here in bold print, it's the devil, the adversary, Satan, the wicked one, walking in heaven with a voice on the council and in the court of Almighty God. Now, I know that may not make sense to you, but can I remind you, God moves in a mysterious way. Isaiah tried to help us in chapter 55, verse 8, when he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. God talks to Satan and says, where did you come? from. Satan answered in the Lance Watson translation from going up and down, walking to and fro, just hanging out everywhere, looking for some evidence of righteousness, searching for some sign of sanctity or reality, trying to find somebody who's real about their religion, somebody that's worthy of a commendation. And I got bad news for you, God. There ain't nobody nowhere. Nothing is wonderful and nobody is worthy, but God stopped him and said, hold up, bro, man. Yes, there is. I've got somebody. I've saved somebody. I've touched somebody. Somebody is doing right. Somebody is responding to my love. Somebody is real about their religion. I got somebody standing on the promises and let me order their steps. They're trusting in my word. Satan said, who is it? God said, have you considered my servant? Job? Have you seen how he loves 
loves and regards his family? Have you noticed how he honors and affirms his wife? Have you seen how he tithes all his resources? There's no one on earth like Job. He's perfect and prayerful, blameless, fears God, turns from evil. He's living proof against your negativity. He's living proof against your pessimism. Look at Job, Satan, and concede your argument. Look at Job, Satan, and be proven wrong. Look at Job, Satan, and shut your mouth. But Satan was characteristically unconvinced because he had an internal predisposition and a stubborn prejudice against truth that would not permit him to accept the persuasion of the overwhelming objective evidence of Job's scrupulous behavior. So he said, God, that ain't the way I see it. Job does not regard you for nothing. Job is not serving you out of the joy and freedom of his soul. Job is not truly worshiping in you in spirit and in truth. Job is only looking out for Job. Job is not real, sincere, spiritual, or authentic. He doesn't love you. Job only loves what he can get from you. Because look how you have treated Job. You have pampered Job. You have prospered Job. You have put a fence of protection around him to shield everything he has. You preserved his life, protected his health, sustained his family, secured his possessions, created his wealth, blessed his work, caused his riches to grow. But if you stretch out your hand, and knock down that hedge that you've got around him. Take away your fence of faithfulness and snatch away all of his toys and trinkets. Then you get to see the real Job. You'll get to see that any human being can be reduced to what they have. Take away their stuff and they will curse you to your face. God said, oh, no, no, no. You don't know him like I know him. I tell you what, you go ahead and take away his things. Take away his house, his family, his property, but don't you put your hands on him. And in one awful day, my friends, by enemy attack, sweeping fire, terrible sword, and natural calamity, Job lost everything and everybody that he had. He lost every dollar, every piece of livestock, every acre of land. His three daughters, his seven sons all swept away in a terrible tornado. Every servant killed outright. Yet, in the midst of all that loss, in the midst of that explosion of chaos, what I want to draw your attention to is that one person in every instance was designated to survive. And they all came back to Job with the same testimony, telling him what happened, and then concluding that I alone was left to tell you. Can I park right there if I keep the motor running? Because there's a word here tonight, not just about them, but about us. Because trial, trouble, and tragedy come to every life, yet the testimony of this text is, no matter how terrible the tragedy or how catastrophic the crisis, God will always ensure that somebody is left as the designated survivor. Don't miss that tonight because that's an answer for somebody on your road because you've been wondering during the days of your life, why am I still alive? Why did I make it when so many of the people that I grew up with, ran with, hung with, did dirt with, are not here any longer? I'm looking for the honest people tonight, for somebody honest enough to admit that you made some mistakes, honest enough to admit you got some errors in your file and some blunders in your background. And if justice had been done with all the fumbles and failings you've had, with all the stuff you did in the dark that ain't came to the light, with all the nights you spent in the wrong places with the wrong people doing the wrong thing, if justice had been done, you wouldn't be up in here right now. I, I'm just looking for a few folk who are willing to admit tonight, since we're all together, that you haven't always been brother baptized and sister sanctified and Reverend Willie Wonder and 
mother holier than thou that you know what it is tell the truth to have some spirits under your sink that are not holy some clothes in the closet that was reserved for the club some numbers in your phone that should never be dialed and some things you said that should have never been said somebody ought to pause right there and praise God because if it had not been for the Lord see we are alive tonight not because we've been so good but we are alive because of the grace and mercy of almighty God so that raises the next question why did God allow them to survive why has God protected and preserved us well it's right there in the text that God always designates a survivor because God wants to leave somebody to tell the story there are places God wants you to go things God wants you to do doors God wants you to open people God wants you to meet blessings God wants you to have victory God wants you to achieve but that's not why God kept you alive. God kept you alive so that you could be a witness to God's grace, God's goodness and God's glory. Well, what story should I tell as a witness? I'm glad you asked. Here's the first thing all of us ought to tell going out of this citywide revival this week. We ought to tell people, especially in the midst of all the fear and paranoia about corruption coronavirus tell people God is still in charge would you practice on your neighbor look at your neighbor say God's still in charge see wait wait and let me show it to you let me show it to you because in verses 13 through 21 I didn't read it all these survivors come to Job one after another with word of these tragedies and yet in each instance the power of God is present such that despite what had transpired one was preserved to testify see often when things fall apart when the bottom drops out when tragedy strikes when troubles rise we begin to doubt God's ability and question God's capacity we don't always understand what God is doing and in those moments when we cannot trace God's hand we have to trust God's heart we have to keep on affirming that he that has begun this good work in me is able to complete it and he will that no weapon formed against me shall prosper that no good thing will God withhold from those who walk upright because he knows the way that I take and when he has tried me I shall come forth as pure gold he knows my uprising and my downfalling he knows my thoughts from afar off and he may not come when I want him but he will be on time because he's an on time God yes he is Wait, let me explain. Let me explain. You know what? The only survivor of a shipwreck was once washed up on a small uninhabited island. He prayed every day for somebody to rescue him until one day he decided to do something to try to help himself out. He built him a little hut out of driftwood for protection from the wind, the sun, the rain, and the cold. But the next day a storm rolled in, lightning struck, and struck the hut, and it burst into flames devastated he cried out to God why what did I do to deserve this he sat down by that burnt down hut and sobbed himself to sleep but early the next day he was awakened by the sound of a ship's horn off in the distance and looking up he saw a ship coming he started jumping up and down and waving wildly and excited to be rescued he asked the captain he said how did you know I was here the captain said we saw your smoke signal y'all missed that but sometimes God has to burn your stuff down just in order to get you rescued God is still in charge but the second thing you ought to tell people is that God has a word for you 
because notice in the text, each one of them had a piece of the story. None of them had the entire story. God kept them alive so that they could tell their piece of the story. Please hear me tonight because our stories are not isolated incidents of deliverance, but each of us in all of these churches hold a piece of God's ongoing tale of freedom, liberation, and redemption in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And God kept us alive so that we could tell our part of the story. God intends for your faith to be a viral and to be contagious that means you have to handle it delicately because you'll infect everybody around you go on tap your neighbor say neighbor my faith is like the coronavirus if I touch you you gonna get it if I talk to you long enough you gonna get it if I'm in your presence enough you gonna get it and that's how God wants it because telling our story being our witness winning souls is not an extracurricular activity it's the fundamental reason why we are alive it's the reason we didn't die it's the reason we didn't perish it's the reason why neither the pipe the people the penitentiary the pain the problem the paralysis the gossip the setback the separation the divorce the layoff the foreclosure the repossession the attack the drawbacks did not destroy you God kept you alive so that you could be a witness go on, smile at somebody and say I'm alive for a reason I survived for a reason I'm breathing for a reason I made it for a reason I survived the tears for a reason I have a testimony I am a witness to what God can do Oh, okay, I, I'll try to help the rest of y'all. Look, I, don't judge me on this, but, but don't judge me on this. Don't, don't judge me on this. I, I, I don't know how many of you have ever seen the Quentin Tarantino movie that is entitled Kill Bill. Oh, okay, tell your holy neighbor, say, I can tell by the size of the halo on your head, you don't watch them kind of movies. Okay, wait. And I admit, Bishop, that it is not something that you want to watch with your kids. Because Kill Bill is a revenge drama about a woman named The Bride who is played by Uma Thurman. The Bride, can I tell you the story, was a former assassin who worked for a man named Bill until she found out that she was pregnant. When she found out she was carrying life, she no longer wanted to participate in taking life. So in trying to change her life, Bill would not let her do it. Wanting not to lose her, he sent several of her former colleagues out to hunt her down and assassinate her. She was shot in the head and left incapacitated in a coma from which she woke up four years later and the only thing on her mind after she woke up was to kill Bill. After coming out of that vegetative coma, she began a time of intense training to recapture her skills. She traveled to Japan to train, and from there she set off on a mission to kill Bill and her former four colleagues who operated under the nickname the Four Deadly Vipers. She apprehended the first one in Japan, a ca character called Orin Ishii, who was played by Lucy Liu. Orin Ishii in the movie had risen to the top of the Yakuza crime family in Japan. She is now the number one stunner, big baller, shot caller, who is constantly surrounded by a team of highly trained assassins that were called the 88 Black Balls. Now I go into this detail because I know y'all ain't seen the movie. The bride, played by Uma Thurman, shows up at Orin Ishii's lair to kill her, only to find 88 men waiting to attack her. She then systematically incapacitates 
maims, kills, knocks out Cole, 88 of the most highly trained assassins in the world before she got to Orion Ishii. When she gets to Orion Ishii, the two of them had an epic battle and Orion Ishii lost to Uma Thurman. Uma Thurman killed her and sorely wounded her servant Sophie. But when it was time to kill Sophie, she backed up off her and left her alive. When Sophie woke up in the hospital in intensive care, Bill was standing next to her. And Bill had one question on his mind. He said, why in the world didn't she kill you? And Sophie said, she left me alive to let you know she's alive and she's coming after you. Do you want to know why God left you alive? He left you alive so you could tell somebody else he's alive and he's coming after you. Go on, look at your neighbor and say, God's coming after you. See, God left you alive so that you could be a witness, not a defense attorney, because God is the one who pleads your case. He don't need you to plead his case. He just need to make sure when you get on the witness stand that you won't take the fifth, but you will testify as to what you have seen, heard, and discovered. So if God has healed you, you can testify that he's a healer. If he's paid your bills, Bills, you can testify he's a provider. If he's fought your battles, you can testify that he can. If he's made a way, you can testify he's a way maker. Go on, practice on your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I've got a testimony. Now look at him again. Say, no, let me rephrase. I am a testimony. What story should we tell? Well, you tell them God's still in charge. Tell them God has a word for you. But then thirdly, you ought to tell them God is still worthy of your praise. Wait, let me show it to you in the text. Because Job had nothing left but himself and the companionship of his wife. And yet in the midst of the wreck and ruin of his world, he says at the end, naked I came into this world and naked I will return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Here it is, blessed. Y'all miss that, amen. Be the name of the Lord. God has kept us alive so that we might testify that no matter what happens, no matter when it happens, no matter how it happens, God is still worthy to be praised. If God doesn't do anything else for you, God is still worthy. If not another door opened, God is still worthy. If not another way was made, God is still worthy. If you don't get your healing, God is still worthy. If you don't get delivered, God is still worthy. Not just because of what he's done, but because of who he is. God is Alpha and Omega. God is the first and the last. God is the beginning and the end. God is everything you need. He's a rock in a weary land. He's a shelter in the storm. He's a bridge over troubled water. He's a doctor when you get sick. He's a lawyer when you're in trouble. Somebody ought to lift his name. Somebody ought to throw your hand up and give God a wave offering and just testify like the psalmist, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Look at your neighbor and say, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me my soul cries hallelujah I am a witness I am a witness he will make a way he will fight a battle he will pay a bill he will lift your head won't he do it say yeah Look at your neighbor 
my neighbor. I don't care what it is. I will survive this. I will survive this. I will survive this. Thank you.